Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's edition of Patchcast. Today is Tuesday, May 9th, 2023. I am Rifat Manan in California, and I am remotely joined by my good friend Emilio Madrigal in Boston. Today, we are very delighted to welcome back Dr. Tionia Boyd, who is Professor of Pathology at Baylor College of Medicine, and she is also the Chief of Anatomic Pathology at Texas Children's Hospital. So today she is going to deliver a talk on pediatric pathology and the title of her talk will be Maternal and Fetal Vascular Malperfusion. As always, please feel free to post your questions and comments on YouTube and Facebook chat windows and we will pass them on to Dr. Boyd at the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Boyd for joining us today, over to you. Thank you all very much and I'm sorry I'm a few minutes late. I moved from the East Coast to Central Time almost three years ago, and I still don't have the time zones correct. So I thought I was going to be talking in an hour from now and was in the middle of a leadership meeting. So my apologies. Okay, let's get started. This is a lecture on two different perfusion pathways, maternal vascular perfusion and fetal vascular perfusion. I know you've already gotten an entire uh, lecture on fetal vascular malperfusion uh, by my good friend, Dr. Sanjita Ravi Shankar. So I will, I will cover that again, but try not to spend quite as much time since that will now be, should be information you've heard before. Okay. So this is one of my favorite places in the world. I gave a podcast last summer. I have no idea if I showed uh, slides, uh, beautiful slides, but this is a um, ski town. It's an old mining town in southwestern Colorado called Telluride, Telluride, Colorado. It's called a, it's in a box canyon, which means that there are mountains on three sides. So the single road in is the single road out. Um, this is entirely un impassable. The, uh, the far end of the, uh, of the valley is, uh, unless you're in a very brave in an all wheel drive in the middle of the summer when the snow is melted but one of my favorite places in the world. Okay, let's talk a little bit by setting up uh, vascular supply, supply and embryonic anatomy. Um, as you know, we all start out as bilaminar and then trilaminar germ discs, but very, very early in gestation, the overwhelming volume of the um, fertilized embryo is going to be extra embryonic or placental compartment um, cells that, that then develop into tissues. What determines the, the umbilical cord insertion site is not, um, it, it, what, excuse me, what determines the umbilical cord insertion site is what's called the fetal pole. So where the fetus is in relation to this uh, spherical um, early, early chorionic disc. And usually the umbilical insertion is deeper in the endometrium. So is, it makes sense that it would be in the deepest, most vascularized place of the fertilized embryo. If an umbilical cord is not central or is not eccentric, so just off center, but is marginal or velamentous, it is because the, the placenta grows without symmetry around the umbilical cord, meaning if uh, in this diagram on the right, the perfusion were better on the right than the left, the placental disc itself once, um, once the embryo is growing would establish itself by growing asymmetrically in an area of better blood perfusion. This is why with placenta previa, for example, because the lower uterine segment doesn't, uh, doesn't decidualize well and it's not as well supported in, by vascular anatomy as the fundus, with uh, placenta previa, you will often have marginal or velamentous insertions because the placental disc grows upward. Okay, but the vast majority of, as I said, the volume of the early embryo is, uh, is extra, uh, extra embryonic or placental. And as we know, there are two circulations that are established, the fetal and the maternal circulations. Of course, we all know placental anatomy. I use this diagram to uh, demonstrate um, to trainees and lay people what that looks like in, uh, in utero, the fetal surface, maternal surface, and then of course, a cross section of uh, the placenta attached to the uterus. And this is a picture of a normal placenta on the right. Okay, so on to the dual perfusion. Uh, let's start with a fetal vascular perfusion, which is the second half of this uh, lecture, but it's easier to describe. Um, the, the fetal um, 
vast vessels are in my mind like an upside down tree in the environment. So the tree trunk is our, uh, our is the umbilical uh, cord with its vessels. The first generational branches from the umbilical vessels are the fetal surface or chorionic vessels. They dive down into ever smaller ramifications. First, first muscular transport vessels, the stem vessels, eventually terminating at the capillary level in uh, distal mature intermediate villi if it's at term. Um, and that circuit needs to be complete from fetus through the placenta and back again in order for there to be uh, adequate fetal oxygen and nutrient exchange in utero on the fetal side. On the maternal side, mom's blood is responsible for growing the placenta and the placenta and mom in conjunction grow the baby. And so if there are perfusion disorders, they uh, very much affect placental pathology. F fetal elements may or may not be uh, affected, meaning fetal growth, for example. So as we know, the, the maternal blood that's oxygenated comes in through uh, uh, spiral arterioles and then circulates in, in the body of the placenta and drains down into maternal veins. These distinctions between um, arterial uh, release and venous drainage are not necessarily visible when you're looking at the base of the placenta, but they, they, are, they are present in an orderly fashion. Therefore, just under normal circumstances, the maturation of the area where there's uh, a in, input of arterial blood flow should be relatively uh, slightly more immature than where there's venous drainage because it's a higher oxygen content area. So there's not as much of an oxygen drive push to mature the placenta. The reason I'm saying this is as we all know, there are there's a variation in, in maturation, even in normally developed placentas. Some areas look a little bit more hyper mature than others, even if it's all appropriate for gestational age. And two, like with the fetal circulation, the maternal circulation requires a complete circuit of mom's heart uh, pumping out blood, that blood going to the uterine uh, arteries and being distributed in the placenta, draining back down again into the maternal veins. And as we all know, mom's blood serves as the uh, as the the waste machinery, as it were, for unwanted fetal products, Car carbon dioxide and uh, waste products that the fetus uh, distributes into the terminal villi in order for that to be taken up in mom's blood at the same time, oxygen and nutrient rich blood is, is taken up by other distal terminal villi. Maternal vascular malperfusion, and this is the first slide, refers to chronic suboptimal uteroplacental perfusion. It includes underperfusion and hyperperfusion, and it replaces terms like utero placental underperfusion, or my least favorite term, placental insufficiency, because the placenta can fail to work properly through any number of mechanisms and maternal malperfusion is just one of them. Um, maternal vascular malperfusion is associated with intrinsic maternal vascular disease, such as hypertension, whether it's chronic, gestational, or uh, more severe, uh, evolving into preeclampsia or eclampsia. It's associated with insulin-dependent diabetes, especially if di the, the diabetes is chronic or difficult to modify, and there is uh, diabetic arteriopathy elsewhere in the mom. Uh, in certain forms of autoimmunity, that most notably the lupus anticoagulant group of, uh, of autoimmune disorders, um, are a, a player in maternal vascular malperfusion, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. And rarely maternal malperfusion can be due to abnormal uterine anatomy. So for example, if there's a uterine septum and the placenta implants on the septum, it's not going to be as well decidualized and vascularized as a normal implantation on the wall of the uterus. But really this will lead to, it won't lead to certain things like you would never see decidual arteriopathy with abnormal uterine anatomy, or maybe the placenta, it, um, it inserts over a subucosal lyomyoma. So you'll see growth restriction, but not, not decidual arteriopathy of the severe type where you see fibrinoid necrosis. So it has, this can form, this can result in malperfusion, um, but only of certain 
phenotypes, both gross and microscopic. There's an increased risk of recurrence with either unmodifiable or unmodified disease. What does that mean? The lower risk patients are those that have disorders that don't recur. So pre preeclampsia and premigravitis is not necessarily followed by preeclampsia and subsequent pregnancies. Higher risk are these categories. The patients are non-compliant, so it's a disease that's modifiable but is not being modified by virtue of behavior. The etiology is not discerned, and I'm going to show you an example of that with autoimmunity. And if the disease is medically refractory, some diseases are brittle, and even though the appropriate treatments are employed, um, it is difficult to control the disorder and hypertensive type diseases come to mind. There's a panoply, as we know, of gross and microscopic findings and clinical conditions in the setting of maternal vascular malperfusion. Clinical can include, but not necessarily uh, require uh, by any means, any of the following, fetal growth restriction, neonatal hypoglycemia, that's due to subacute stress in utero, oligohydramnios, again, poor maternal perfusion, and therefore uh, reduced oxygen delivery of the fetus and relative shunting of fetal blood systemically away from the pelvis, away from the kidneys toward the brain, so you have reduced urinary output. Um, and maternal diseases stated previously, plus obesity. And that's because with obesity, at least part of that is because they're often comorbid diseases with obesity, like diabetes, like uh, hypertension. Gross placental findings can include placental growth restriction, a thin placental disc, narrow umbilical cord, or abnormal cord insertion. Well, why would there be abnormal cord insertion? It's as I said, with that first uh, diagram of the embryo and the 360 degree uh, chorionic uh, villa structure that um, that in in circumstances where there is intrinsic maternal vascular disease, not all maternal vessels in the uterus are going to be equally affected, and so the placenta will grow preferentially toward areas of better perfusion, which is why there is actually an association with abnormal cord insertion and maternal malperfusion in in that kind of way. Microscopic features, there are many, as you know, they can include placental abruption, which could also be a, a gross finding, placental infarction, decidual arteriopathy of either the mild, that is non-transformation of spiral arterioles with muscular hypertrophy, or severe phenotype, which is fibrinoid necrosis with or without atherosis, distal villus hypoplasia, increased syncytial knots, aggregated terminal villi, villus hypermaturation, increased perivillus fibrin, and the list goes on. You can see on and on. Okay. So here are two placentas, two different patients, and unequivocally, unequivocally, I can tell you with these two placentas that, that this, these were pregnancies that were lost. You wouldn't necessarily know that from the placenta, but lost because of intrinsic maternal vascular disease that was not modified during pregnancy. And so what I see in, on either uh, the left or right-hand panel are multiple rounded structures that vary from a dark red and apparently newly clotted to very firm and white. So these are all placental infarcts of varying ages. So the reason I can say unequivocally, maternal vascular disease that's not modified is not only is a lot of the placental parenchyma taken up by this, but by infarction, but it's temporally heterogeneous. In other words, the propensity for infarction persists over time. Um, so that in either of these placentas, there's, there's uh, markedly reduced functional placental volume. So if you start out with a small placenta to begin with, and then you further reduce the functional volume, these are the kinds of, of placentas where fetuses can actually, if there's not intervention, uh, die in utero from a, a chronic maternal vascular malperfusion. Now in uh, in countries where prenatal care is fairly routine, that doesn't happen often. It does happen, usually in cases with uh, poor or no, no prenatal care, um, uh, but it does happen. Now, what I want to say about this particular uh, slide image, uh, and let's say it's the left-hand slide, this was the placenta from a fourth pregnancy of a woman who had stillbirths midway through each pregnancy, and that same thing happened in this case. I had, no, uh, I had no pathology for any of the previous losses, but I did have the autopsy and placenta, the fetal autopsy. 
the fetus was emaciated. I mean, second trimester fetuses normally have a, not a relatively low content of subcutaneous fat, but this was a, an emaciated second trimester fetus. So clearly, clearly growth restricted, both in terms of size and, and in terms of fat distribution. So this fetus in, it literally starved to death uh, because of placental pathology. So after the fourth loss, I looked into the mother, which was the first loss known to me, I looked in the mother's chart and saw that all of her losses had been at about the same gestational age. And they all had, there were all growth restricted fetuses, but mom was not hypertensive. She didn't have diabetes. She wasn't obese. Um, and, uh, she, and she was otherwise healthy. And so I called the obstetrician and I said, you should test the mom for autoimmunity because a, the, some autoimmune disorders can have a a gross and microscopic placental phenotype that is ind indistinguishable from hypertensive type disorders. And sure enough, mom had uh, lupus anticoagulant antibodies. And so that presumably in taking modulating that disease process for her uh, may have resulted in a future pregnancy, pregnancy that was actually successful. Um, this particular lesion on the left-hand side, and you can see it's microscopic correlate on the right, is a rounded intraplacental hematoma, otherwise known as an infarction hematoma. And what occurs, I believe, because these are highly associated with hypertensive disorders, is that mom has a hypertensive spike, right, systemically. And because the spiral arterioles are not remodeled well and become they don't become amuscular, then mom likewise has hyper, hypertension and constriction of uterine arterioles and then followed by, by a jet stream because of the constriction, you increase the flow velocity, right, of blood. And so mom shoots a jet of blood into the center of this area, which then coagulates because it can't drain, causes placental infarction around it and this central cavity AKA infarction hematoma. This, this is highly associated, as I said, with maternal hypertensive type disorders. Here's an example of a recent placental abruption. Um, and uh, to orient you on the left-hand side is the decidua basalis. To the left of that, you can see adherent blood clot and also at the base of the image. Uh, and obviously the placental disc is to the right. A couple of observations I can tell you about this this particular slide is as follows. Number one, this fulfills the definitional criteria of that is diagnostic pathologically of placental abruption because you have adherent retroplacental blood with overlying placental infarction. So this is absolutely diagnostic of placental abruption. If you will notice the the most uh, the the most basal chorionic villi, i.e. the ones close to the base, decidua basalis, it looks very solid because when an abruption occurs, that maternal blood walls off the ability of any other maternal blood to flow into the placenta in that area. And because mom's blood keeps the placenta alive, you undergo placental infarction or the placenta undergoes placental infarction. And as a result of that, what happens is that the absence of maternal blood flowing in, into the inner villa space will make will allow the space to collapse. In other, in other words, the villi all come to touch one another because there's no maternal blood flowing in to keep the uh, chorionic villi separated, as you see on the right. The, the first microscopic feature of cell death that I can recognize, and it's a hard one to recognize, is syncytiotrophoblast uh, nuclear smudging. But that can be tricky because it, some, some areas can look a little smudged, but not be and not be infarcted. So you, you have to be pretty sure that you have multiple areas where you say, yes, I'm seeing the uh, hematoxlophilic qualities of the nuclei in these cells uh, fading and smudging. Another thing you can see, in addition to the parenchymal collapse and the nuclear smudging, is uh, you can say, see after some hours, you begin to get an infiltration of neutrophils. And I've seen cases where the question is, is this acute velitis? And it's the, I think it's the blood, maternal blood, and with now dying tissues, you uncover novel antigens and you're getting non-infectious neutrophilic response to clean up the debris. The other thing that's present on this slide to the right are very red villi. I happen to know, although I, it would, might be hard to convince you from this power, that this is intra villus hemorrhage. 
I-N-T-R-A. So not with, between the villi, within the villi. And this is the equivalent of a uh, placental bruise. In other words, if you, uh, if you accidentally hit your skin, the superficial uh, dermal capillaries may, may break and you'll end up with a bruise. In the same way with placental abruption, when the placenta pulls away from the uterus, that may impart a, an instantaneous greater pressure and explosion of uh, fetal capillaries over the abrupted area, hence intravillous hemorrhage. And intravillous hemorrhage is the only instantaneous microscopic feature that's seen in placental abruption actually the only gross feature because adherent blood clot with cavitation, as you know, takes time to evolve. Um, and so intravillous hemorrhage is in the appropriate setting uh, also very, very consistent with placental abruption. The caveat is you can get intravillous hemorrhage under a couple of other circumstances unrelated to abruption. And one of them is cesarean delivery with mechanical manipulation of the placenta. So you have to be careful in ascribing too much importance to the intravillous hemorrhage unless you have compelling information otherwise that it's associated with an abruption. And here is distal villus hypoplasia. My definition of distal villus hypo, hy, hypoplasia is an uh, underbranched scrawny tree. It's like, again, a tree in the environment um, where the tree doesn't get enough water or nutrients or sunlight. And the branches that are there are sparse, so they're widely spaced and they're pathologically small. That is distal villus hypoplasia. There is a criterion for, a set for diagnosing DVH, however. One needs to take the bottom two thirds of a full thickness placental disc and the DVH pattern needs to occupy at least 30% of that lower two thirds. And why do you use the lower two thirds and of the central disc? It's because the subchorionic zone and the perimeter of the placenta are physiologically ischemic zones. Under the chorionic plate, mom's blood uh, flows up. It's already relatively de deoxygenated from traveling through the placenta. It hits the chorionic plate, it's turbulent. You always get ischemic changes, always, even in normal placentas under the chorionic plate and at the edge of the, of the placenta, again, because maternal perfusion is turbulent. What, you, what I use, though, as a rule of thumb for distal villus hypoplasia, and I'm about to show you a higher magnification, is I look for syncytiotropoblasts appearing to float into space that is unconnected to villi. So for example, on the left-hand side, I wrote increased syncytial knots, but if, if let's assume that this was a higher power of the previous slide, it's not, this is a different case, but there, there are um, multinucleated uh, syncytiotropoblasts seeming to float in space. In fact, they are connected to chorionic villi, but the chorionic villi are so pathologically small, they can hide beneath the multi-nucleated uh, syncytiotropoblast. So for example, this is a chorionic villus. If this syncytiotropoblast had been affixed to it, attached to that chorionic villus, and you were to look at it in this direction, you would be unable to see the, uh, the chorionic villus. All you would see is the trophoblast. And let me see if I can find another example in cross-section. So here's one where you can see the syncytia trophoblast, and it's uh, to the side of this chorionic villus. If you one turned this up 90 degrees counterclockwise, it could block the entire villus. So these free-floating Pre floating appearing syncytial trophoblasts are a very good rule of thumb if you think you have distal villus hypoplasia. There are increased syncytial knots because distal villus hypoplasia is not only a scrawny um, and, uh, and uh, underdeveloped tree in the environment or underbranched tree in the environment, but there's also a push for accelerated villus maturation. That's always a component of DVH, distal villus hypoplasia. On the right is a pattern that you can see with maternal malperfusion, which are uh, chorionic villi that are agglutinated together. These are aggregated terminal villi. An old term for this is microinfarct, because what can happen is if the uh, uh, villi agglutinate, there's no maternal perfusion into the center of this aggregated uh, terminal villus area, and the center can undergo a local ischemic infarction. In other words, it's not the interruption of maternal blood supply, it's that it can't get around all of these agglutinated villi. So this is a feature one can see in conjunction with increased syncytial knots in the setting of maternal vascular malperfusion. The least common of all features that, that I, I see in the placenta is this excess of cytotrophoblast fibrinoid islands. So 
you, where you get these nodules. Some of them are small, microscopic. These are, you know, twice as large as a distal stem villus. So they're relatively small, or you can get much larger plaques. Sometimes they're even a little serpiginous. And what, what occurs, I believe, in a, a wise uh, placental pathology uh, colleague of mine once said that when, when exposed to hypoxia, these extravillous cytotrophoblasts that normally reside in the placenta revert to their immature phenotype as early implantation trophoblasts. And part of what implantation trophoblasts do is to elaborate, elaborate a fibrinoid matrix in order to cut through the, uh, the extracellular uh, stroma in the endometrium and form the uh, implantation site. So they're recapitulating their embryonic counterparts, although of course, in this case, it's, it's not a functional recapitulation. Here's the sigil arteriopathy of the severe variety with uh, fibrinoid necrosis, this misnomer term, which um, refers to a re the replacement of the uh, decidual vessel wall with this, with this dense hyalinized bubble cum pink material. And you can or don't have to have lipid-laden macrophages. So either with or without acute atherosis, this is with acute atherosis. So the severe phenotype of decidual arteriopathy occurs with a starting phenotype of, uh, of mild decidual arteriopathy. In other words, I have seen many cases in transition where you start out with muscular hypertrophy and then that muscular wall becomes remodeled by this fibrinoid material. So for example, here on the upper right at about three and four o'clock, are some residual smooth muscle cells from this vessel. The other thing to point out is that this fibrinoid wall is exceedingly thrombogenic. So if you look, you can see fibrin strands that have occluded the entirety of this lumen and reduced it to uh, a fraction, about a third or a fourth of its normally uh, patent size. And here, here again is another vessel involved by severe decidual arteriopathy. This one is a little well less developed. Um, it's hard to recognize the severe phenotype of decidual arteriopathy in the decidua basalis, so the base of the placenta, because physiologic transformation of those vessels can mimic decidual arteriopathy. Therefore, it's much easier to see these findings in the extraplacental membranes. Uh, there's also more real estate to look at. In other words, you have more profiles of tissue that have decidual uh, arteries within them. And so what, that's the reason that one looks in the the one looks for decidual arteriopathy in the extraplacental membranes. It serves as a surrogate for what's happening in the decidua basalis, which is, of course, where the real damage comes because the spiral arterioles in the extraplacental membranes don't anymore participate in, or beneath the membranes, don't anymore participate in placental perfusion. So the membranes are a surrogate for what's happening in the decidua basalis. I'm now ready to switch to fetal vascular malperfusion. Um, and this is a uh, view of Telluride, the town that I showed you in the first photograph on Main Street um, some summers ago. So you, the, in front of us is the Box Canyon, the end of the canyon, mountains on either side. And this is exactly what an old American mining town looks like. So this started out, ag again, as a mining town. And like many other uh, resorts, in particularly in Colorado, have been transformed over time into ski resorts. All right, I'm moving along to fetal vascular malperfusion now. And again, as I said, you have covered this already, or it's already been covered in a previous lecture, so I'll try to spend a little bit less time on this. Uh, the definition is non-acute fetal vascular flow restriction. What do I mean by non-acute? Anything that, that on a, in a not acute catastrophic way will diminish blood flow used through the cord to the baby and back. So for example, acute cord prolapse, where the cord prolapses into the vaginal canal in front of the, the presenting part, that's not fetal vascular malperfusion, that's acute cord prolapse. So these are, are more, more prolonged mechanisms of potential uh, reduction in fetal vascular flow. The anti, um, uh, the, the differential diagnosis, because what one sees is obliteration of vessels, is postmortem passive involution. In other words, uh, the, the, with, the, with the cessation of the fetal heartbeat, there's no more blood that flows anywhere into the placenta, and all of the placental vessels in unison start to undergo obliterative changes. 
So the real key, one of the keys to recognizing postmortem passive vascular involution is that it's it's temporally uniform. It's relatively global and temporally uniform, whereas fetal vascular malperfusion has temporal heterogeneity. In other words, some areas that are affected, some that are not. Um, it's usually, FVM is usually due to some form of physical umbilical flow restriction. So something that's squeezing the vessels as they, uh, a, 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 in the umbilical cord. So for example, abnormal cord insertions like marginal velamenta surfurcate cords where the vessels are relatively unprotected. That's a predisposing condition. Uh, other abnormalities, hypercoiling, body and nuchal cords, a narrow cord diameter where there's less Wharton's jelly, and hypercoiling, there's now some evidence, uh, may also be a predisposing mechanism to FVM because somehow the right kind of coiling rel protects the vascular flow. Um, hypercoiling causes its, its, uh, its flow restriction by being so hypercoiled that there are many torques of the of a, the umbilical vessel that have to go in a spiral, and anything that disrupts a linear path of flow, blood or otherwise, causes turbulence and the blood flow slows. And so, flow stasis is the setup for clotting. Um, clinical entities that can lead to oligo include oligohydr. I mean, that can lead to I'm sorry, FVM include oligohydramnios, right? Too little amniotic fluid to buoy the umbilical cord which is now prone to get trapped between the fetal body and the uterine wall, and maybe polyhydramnios, where, the, where it like, acts like a tamponade. I'm not sure about that, but I have seen FVM in association with polyhydramnios and no other predisposing condition that I could discern. Rarely is FVM due to other causes, which include intrinsic fetal blood hypercoagulability or diminished fetal cardiac output. Examples are, uh, diabetes, gestational diabetes, mellitus associated hyperglycemia and polycythemia where mom's blood is literally thick and the, 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 the glucose content in mom's blood gets transferred across uh, uh, terminal villus basement membranes into fetal blood. So the baby becomes hyperglycemic and therefore uh, it, it, the, the, the blood becomes sugary, if you will, and therefore thicker if you like try to overstir too much sugar in a drink. Uh, and transient myeloproliferative disorder. So something that will increase the white count markedly. A, a trisomy 21 baby that's born with a white count of 120,000 has transient myeloproliferative disorder or congenital leukemia. That's a setup for uh, fetal vascular malperfusion. And then cardiac output compromise. So there's certain congenital cardiac defects that uh, result in diminished cardiac output even in utero. And, um, and if it's a placenta that has global distal villus hypoplasia, think about this. So you're having to squirt the, uh, the entire cardiac output into very narrow channels and not that many of them downstream. That invokes resistance, placental resistance. And so you can get cardiac output compromise because of distal villus hypoplasia. Even though under normal circumstances, the restriction occurs at the cord level, the effects are rarely seen at the umbilical cord. In other words, umbilical cord thrombi are, are very uncommon. It's much more common to see clotting in these nodal branch areas uh, of umbilical vessel um, you know, uh, distribution. So these chorionic vessels, this is an umbilical vessel. Here's a chorionic vessel. It has to make this uh, angulated turn in order for the umbilical vessel to splay out onto the chorionic plate as a chorionic vessel, this is a node of turbulent flow. And so it's, there is a predisposition to clotting in distinct transition areas. This is not something you can recognize when you're looking at placental side. I'm saying conceptually, I believe that's what occurs. Um, so that you end up getting thrombi on anti-mortem or antenatal thrombi, actual thrombi in muscular, muscular vessels of the placenta only. So that's umbilical cord, it's rare, chorionic and stem vessels. Downstream of, of flow cessation somewhere upstream, you get changes that show a, a regional disruption of a vascular flow into the affected area. So the first pattern that you see is villus stromal cariorexis, right, the, the red blood cells uh, start to undergo um, uh, um, fragmentation and distribution into the villus stroma because you lose the endothelial integrity since there's no fetal blood flowing in. Uh, 
Um, and, and so you get first VSK, and then eventually over time, they, they transition to fully avascular villi. And the reason I'm using this diagram is the oval represents, um, represents the uterus, and obviously this is the placental fetal vascular tree. Uh, as I already said, in muscular vessels, the patterns that you see are thrombosis, vascular ectasia. It's very nonspecific. It should never be a sole or primary uh, finding to diagnose fetal vascular malperfusion. If it's present, in addition to other findings, it's a helpful, a supportive feature, but unto itself is, is much too nonspecific. True thrombosis, though, is, is clotting. It's clotting in vessels. Intramural fibrin deposition is the term that now replaces intimal cushion. And this refers to uh, fibrin strands that are entrapped within the, the affected um, muscular vessel wall. I believe many of those are actually organized thrombi, but the term that we use is intramural fibrin deposition. And then there's stem vessel obliteration that replaces stem vessel endovasculopathy. Um, or hemorrhagic endovasculitis. Stem vessel obliteration is, an, is, a, is a microscopic appearance of stem vessels that are not clotted, but nevertheless have lost their endothelial, endothelial integrity and the red cells start fragmenting and extravasating out into the wall of the stem villus. So this is the muscular vessel equivalent of villus stromal vascular cariorexis, but you don't use that term in muscular vessels. You use VSK only at the capillary level, but it's the equivalent process. So stem vessel obliteration. In the capillary level vessels of the distal mature intermediate and terminal villi, one sees as an earlier, uh, as an earlier feature, VSK villus stromal vascular cariorexis, which replaces hemorrhagic endovasculitis and uh, event eventuating in avascular villi. Um, the, there are patterns of extent considered segmental and global. These are practically speaking not helpful uh, in recognizing or grading um, fetal vascular malperfusion. There is, there is, however, a note to be made around high-grade lesions. So as with many placental processes, the more of it that you see, the more chronic, the more advanced, the greater the likelihood it may have untoward fetal or neonatal impact. And so with fetal vascular malperfusion, th there's, that's no exception. The greater the features that you see, the more of them that you see, the more of the placenta where you can find muscular vessel or capillary level, level changes, it's a surrogate for how restricted the blood flow is out of the cord and then back in, right? So it's a surrogate for the, for the degree of flow restriction, which is why it's these high-grade patterns that are associated with an increased risk of untoward outcome. I should say about maternal vascular malperfusion, I told you earlier that in countries with routine prenatal care, one, one rarely sees fetal demise in that setting of strict maternal vascular malperfusion. Now we're back to my last seg segment. Uh, one bit, but but uh, by the same token, maternal vascular malperfusion is a pretty common feature in uh, fetuses that get into trouble. If it's a backdrop process, whereby a superimposed process then occurs. In other words, if you have a small placenta, you have reduced functional volume, and then you get fetal vascular malperfusion, which is a different process. It's a fetal blood flow, not maternal blood flow on top of it. So you have two mechanisms of hypoxic stress. Uh, so, so in my experience, small placentas are often a backdrop, as I said, of uh, placentas with fetuses or neonates that, that get into trouble, usually with some sort of neurologic signs or symptoms or, or injury, um, but, it, but is in conjunction with other processes like FVM or high-grade chronic colitis or advanced amniotic fluid infection. So here are some of the many faces of uh, fetal vascular malperfusion and uh, stasis-induced thrombosis. On the upper left-hand corner is a hypercoiled cord uh, as perhaps many of you know, there are different types of link of, of uh, hypercoiling, linked segmental, et cetera. My rule of thumb for determining whether a cord is hyper cord is hypercoiled or not in this fashion um, is if two normally non-contiguous edges of Wharton's jelly come into contact with one another because you've twisted the cord. So normally this bottom edge of this coil and this top edge of the lower coil would not touch one another, but because of the hypercoiling, they come into contact. That's a 
quick and, and dirty rule of thumb if you think you have umbilical hypercoiling, but of course you have to assess the number of coils per centimeter. In the middle uh, upper right-hand panel is a placenta, that's the maternal surface, here's the cord obviously, and a flattened area of umbilical cord that was wrapped around a fetal foot. This was a fetal vascular malperfusion stillbirth, and this was the mechanism of flow restriction was this tight body cord. On the upper right-hand panel is a, a bilobate uterus. This, this, I mean, bilobate placenta, excuse me, this placenta inserted into a bilobate uterus and the velamentous cord insertion was resting on the uterine septum and the fetal body became compressed against the uterine septum and the, uh, the velamentous vessels emanating from the umbilical cord leading to fatal fetal vascular thrombosis. So this is a mechanism that's due to abnormal uh, abnormal maternal uterine architecture. On the on the middle left panel is uh, a true cord knot. Obviously, there's there's slow restriction on one side of the cord and not on the other. These are all stillbirth placentas. Here's uh, here is cord torsion. This is um, a controversial top, controversial observation, usually in second trimester fetuses that die, because some people think that this could occur post mortem. Rarely, I see this. Uh, middle right panel is uh, a rare case of umbilical vein thrombosis. So the entire umbilical, umbilical vein is dilated and in the fresh state, if you palpated it, that is not fixed and formal and the, the blood would not be movable, it's just clotted. Lower left hand corner is a marginal cord insertion um, with, with a distended ectatic uh, chorionic vessel, another one that's thin and white. The extended the distended um, and ectatic chorionic vessel rises above the, the chorionic surface and is wider than what's expected, expected of its neighboring counterparts, such as the, the, on the left-hand side. Um, and if, again, this was examined in the fresh state, one would not be able to palpate the blood back and forth between this clotted chorionic vessel. This, this white atretic looking uh, chorionic vessel is due to remote thrombosis so that the entire lumen is gone. So there's full stem vessel obliteration in this white area, no blood whatsoever because there's no lumen and there may or may not be dystrophic calcification. In the middle panel, another example of the same thing, these large ectatic chorionic vessels, the, the white streaks are, are clots because the, the vessel is still distended. So it's not yet, uh, there's not yet thin vascular obliteration um, and immovable blood in the fresh placenta. And on the right-hand side is a, a very rare finding, which is remote calcified uh, chorionic thrombi from fetal vascular malperfusion. And the reason this is rare is most fetuses die before they don't survive long enough in utero with FVM to, uh, to be able for the, for the um, clots to become calcified, they die in utero. That's a chronic state. Most, I would say most fetuses that die in utero from fetal vascular malperfusion don't, don't survive for probably weeks or months, probably months within that kind of condition. They die a slow hypoxic um, mechanism of demise. Okay, so here are some more features of uh, fetal vascular malperfusion. If you pick up a glass slide, here are four of them, and you look at it with your naked eye and the, the chorionic vessels are markedly distended, they're really ectatic because normally they're inconspicuous. You, I can see from this power, for example, that this vessel or this vessel is many times its normally uh, normal caliber count, counterpart and the rule of thumb is four times. Most of these are easily four times as large for the vascular ectasia. Here is actually, it's pink. This is actually a clotted, um, uh, I don't remember whether it's a chorionic or stem vessel. So I can actually see the clot um, in this particular vessel. On the, beneath that on the lower left uh, are sections of the fetal surface of a placental disc. And these are all clotted chorionic vessels. I can see in the bottom panel, the lamination of a chorionic thrombus. In the lower middle section, I'm showing you stem villus, so muscular vessel, stem vessel obliteration. This is stem vessel obliteration. I told you it was, the, it was equivalent to VSK at the capillary level, although we don't call this villus stromal cariorexis, it's stem vessel obliteration, but it's the very same process as you see uh, on its left-hand side where the uh, 
the terminal villus capillaries or distal villus capillaries have been obliterated and there's extravasation and fragmentation of red blood cells. Parenthetically, sometimes with stem vessel obliteration, you'll see a septate lumen, and it may look like a, a recanalized thrombus in the way we think of that, say, in the lung. That does not happen in the placenta. The, that septate lumen is because there, with cessation of fetal blood flow, there's a very slow fibroblast ingrowth into the lumen, which causes that septation pattern, but it's not a clot that has recanalized. Again, Recanalized clotting does not occur in the placenta by virtue of microscopic appearance. Uh, on the uh, right-hand side in the upper panel are, is fetal blood with a number of nucleated red blood cells. NRDCs are released in response mo most robustly to hypoxic stress. And so in non-acute mechanisms of fetal stress or fetal demise that have perfusion disorders as part of it, maternal and or fetal, NRBCs should be expected. And on the lower right-hand panel, there are avascular villi on the left and normally vascularized villi on the right. If this were a stillbirth, one would know that the avascularity had to have preceded fetal death because the background capillaries of the, of the stillborn fetus are still intact. So this is an anti-mortem process because there is heterogeneity in villus appearance. It's not as though, again, with past post-mortem involution, when the fetus dies and cardiac output stops, everything involutes at a fairly uniform pace. And here's an organizing stem vessel thrombus. So the definition of, for me of organizing is that the fibrin gets, is being incorporated into this, uh, what I call a neo-intima. You'll never see neo-intima as applied to, to uh, the placenta, but the idea that you get this myofibroblastic proliferation uh, at the area of the disrupted endothelium to incorporate the fri fibrin into the wall. And you, one can imagine that if this becomes completely incorporated, and there is uh, more fibroblastic proliferation that grows on the surface, it looks like um, an a, a intramural fibrin cushion, right? So here, here's that appearance on the right, clearly fibrin that's being incorporated into this myofibroblastic proliferation. Under normal circumstances, these, stem, these muscular vessels in the placenta, so cord, uh, chorionic and stem are comprised of endothelium directly opposed to smooth muscle. So there's no intima normally. Therefore, anything that, that is this mixoid intimal proliferation is not, is not native to the placenta as it was growing. It was acquired. Um, and I don't think I want to say any more about that now, but, um, but, but there you go, uh, organizing stem vessel thrombus. This, on the other hand, is an example of stem vessel obliteration. You see there's no clotting. There's no adherent fibrin that's been incorporated. There's no calcification. This is a stem vessel that where somewhere upstream or perhaps downstream, there's been flow cessation. So basically the blood is not moving back and forth either because it's not getting into the stem vessel or more likely it's downstream where the blood was supposed to go. It can't because let's say there's a placental infarct or there's an area of huge avascular villi. Um, uh, and so, uh, so what happens is when you lose the, the reason I say it's more likely a downstream event is you see how dilated the, the vessel wall is. It's as though the blood can't get through. It's not clotted there, but it can't flow normally. And so it looks to me like a backup phenomenon. However, you often can't tell. So it, so this is stem vessel obliteration, loss of endothelial integrity, extravasation of red cells, and eventually uh, fibroblast ingrowth into an avascular vessel. And you can see that on the uh, here in the, in the lower half of the middle of the second image, this right-hand side image, where you have this apparent uh, recanalization that is not acceptation because of fibroblast ingrowth. Now, these vessels are not distended. And so I would say that, um, that if this were a stillbirth baby and there were avascular villi all over the place, I don't know if this is a pattern that evolved because of passive postmortem involution and the fetus was retained for two weeks in utero, or just that's just unto itself without context, right? Without other information to guide you. Um, or is this a stem vessel that that was obliterated because flow just stopped flowing in, not that, that this vessel couldn't release its blood. Okay, I hope that's clear enough. Here are, uh, is another view of the villus stromal vascular carrier axis. 
and uh, one sees in, as these uh, patterns advance over time. In other words, as more time passes between the the fetal vascular malperfusion, cessa cessation of capillary flow, and the delivery of the placenta, they move more and more toward avascular villi. So you can see a nearly avascular villus here on the upper left. Um, you still see a fair amount of, of red cell extravasation on the lower left. And again, this is stem vessel obliteration. And here are avascular villi. This is the, the terminal result of, uh, of cessation of fetal blood flow at the capillary level. You can see this most commonly in FVM, but this can also, as many people probably know, be the end stage appearance of chronic bolitis. And here's the least common of all of the patterns, uh, one called delayed villus maturation. And this is my last content slide. Delayed villus maturation refers to relatively immature and enlarged chorionic villi. That's not the key. The key is that the capillaries are centrally placed so that they do not come to abut the trophoblast basement membrane so that the perfusion is reduced at the level of the terminal villus. Um, so that if you see this villus, the capillaries inside, in order for oxygen to reach this fetal capillary, it would have to travel through syncytia trophoblast nuclei, basement membranes, endothelial basement membranes, or not endothelial, stromal, stromal basement membranes, and then finally in, into the, uh, into the um, capillary. Um, the reason that this occurs as a pattern of chronic uh, suboptimal flow, fetal blood flow, is because it takes a certain rate or velocity of fetal blood flow in order to properly model uh, terminal villi into their mature form. And so, so if the blood is flowing because of upstream FVM, so slow restriction of flow at a, at a capillary level, these villi are not going to get remodeled and you end up with delayed villus maturation. Uh, so th this is a pattern. Centrally placed capillaries, relatively few syncytial knots, relatively larger uh, and more immature looking chorionic villi. This is also seen in the setting of choriangiosis. I mean, excuse me, of diabetes. And here's my crew. This is uh, my entire department. It's a large department for a children's hospital. There were, at the time this photograph was taken, 55 of us um, in the department. And about 13 or 14 of these lovely faces are folks in my division. And that is it. I am finished with my presentation. I don't know if there's time left for answering questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyd. So, uh, that was really amazing. And you have covered so many uh, important features uh, about uh, vascular malformation or malperfusion affecting the fetus and the mother. So there is one question I can see online, Dr. Boyd. So do you mind turning your video on? Oh, not at all. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, yeah. I didn't realize it yeah. was off. No, that's okay. So there is one question that, uh, what is your experience about uh, placental malperfusion in the setting of COVID-19 uh, infection? Yeah. That's a different that? mechanism of malperfusion. It doesn't, it's not a maternal malperfusion in that there is re either too much or too little velocity of blood flow, like in hypertensive disorders, but it's rather that the blood flows normally but is prone to coagulation. So you don't see growth-restricted placentas. You don't see placental abruption and placental infarction. It happens at the local kind of perivillus or intervillus space level with a fibrin that accumulates in the setting of, of a COVID-infected placenta. So it's a perfusion disorder, but not, not in the way I'm talking about uh, aberrant velocity of flow, right, either on the maternal or the fetal side, but that's a good question. So as I said, placental insufficiency, the placenta can fail in any number of ways. It's a horrible term for maternal vascular malperfusion because that's a form of placental insufficiency. The, the uh, effects of COVID uh, uh, placentation uh, when it's severe and affects the placenta. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Boyd. Uh, there is another question I can see. So uh, is villus edema also considered a feature of fetal vascular malperfusion? Mm. If so, how do we grade it? No, it is not, it is not considered a, an Amsterdam criteria, if you know that paper, a feature of fetal vascular malperfusion. Now, could it? Yes, I mean, if you have 
a, a congenital high drops, let's say, or a fetus with cardiac failure due to some complex cardiac disease, you're, you will get villous edema. But in most cases of fetal malperfusion, that's the, not the mechanism. So I would not expect to see it. Therefore, no, it is not a criterion. Right. Thank you. There is another follow-up question from the same viewer that uh, if both features of fetal vascular malperfusion and villitis are there, how do you distinguish avascular villi due to FVM or villitis? That is a really good question. And in many cases, you cannot. So I try to talk about the company that avascular villi keeps. If avascular villi are uh, grouped together, and fully avascular, and there's no chronic villitis around it, and the avascular, the avascular villi are relatively posicellular. In other words, you don't see a, a residuum of inflammatory cells in the stroma. It's probably fetal vascular malperfusion causing avascular villi. If, on the other hand, you have a cluster of avascular villi and you have a lot of chronic villitis in the placenta and nearby, look for residual lymphocytes and histiocytes in the affected avascular villi. And that will provide some clue that it's what I call burned out or senescent chronic villitis. The other clue, and it's a hard one to recognize, is that in my experience, avascular villi due to FVM um, get a collagenized appearance, a heavily collagenized appearance, whereas burned out or senescent chronic villitis, the villi look more hyalinized to me. But that's something that would require you know, sharing a, a screen and a comparison in order to demonstrate what I'm saying. But those are the ways in which one, one can tell. And sometimes it's very hard. Right. Uh, so there is another question. Uh, is there any correlation between intrauterine fetal death and long umbilical cord without any other pathology? And the viewer says that uh, I had a case of IUFD in 39 weeks with long cord and small foci of FBM? That's a hard one. So the way I would address that, if, you're, if the findings of FBM in the placenta are not widespread, is I would, I would say in a, uh, in a comment, I would, I would diagnose fetal vascular malperfusion. So long umbilical cord predisposing condition. So fetal vascular malperfusion. Long, next line, indent, long umbilical cord predisposing condition. And under that, whatever clusters of avascular villi, whatever else it is that you see microscopically in the placenta. But in a comment, I would say that, that the degree of the placenta that's affected is relatively minor, and therefore FVM can only be suggested as a mechanism of demise absent identifying a different mechanism and uh, absent identifying a dis different mechanism either in the placenta or with the fetus. So that, that it could be due to um, fetal vascular malperfusion. The other thing to say, in addition to recognizing uh, the absence of another pathology is if there are a lot of nucleated red blood cells, it's a, that's a non-acute hypoxic mode of death. And if you have FVM, but no other process that could lead to hypoxia, bad chronic bolitis, et cetera, et cetera, then that also increases your increases the likelihood to some degree of FVM. So you can't, I, I would not diagnose it definitively. I would say that it is suggestive, but not confidently uh, identified from the placental evaluation. Right. There is one more question. Uh, some cases we see only stem vessel vasculitis as a form of velitis. Will this lead to thrombus? So can villitis lead to FVM? Yes, in, in, indeed. So what that's called stem vessel, that's stem vessel obliteration in the setting of chronic villitis. Absolutely. That, that, that's how you get avascular villi or uh, stem vessel obliteration is the influx of maternal lymph lymphocytes and histiocytes with disrupting endothelial integrity and you, you lose the integrity of, of the vessels in that affected villus. Right. Um, there is another question, uh, uh, Dr. Boyd. So what are the features that you consider to report FBM as a cause of intrauterine demise since the features overlap? It depends on how long the fetus has been dead in utero. So that's the key. If you have the ability to uh, look at the fetus and try, try to assess grossly or microscopically the interval between fetal demise and delivery, that helps you a lot 
with interpreting uh, the avascularity that you might see in the chorionic villi. I already addressed this once, but I will, I'll, I'll say again, that with passive postmortem involution due to some cause not FVM, you will get a uniform change across the placenta in all of the vessels because the fetal heart stops pumping and all the blood stops flowing at once to the placenta. So the involutional changes across the placenta are relatively uniform. Whereas with anti-mortem FVM, you will see segments of the placenta that are affected and segments that are not. If you see a clot and a fibrin thrombus, recent organized remote calcified anything in any of the muscular vessels, so cord, chorionic or stem, that is unequivocally an anti-mortem process. Clotting does not occur post-mortem. So that's helpful as well. Thanks a lot, Dr. Boyd. I think uh, these are all the questions that uh, I could see online. And our viewers, if you have more questions, you can reach out to us or you can reach out to Dr. Boyd. So she would be more than happy to answer your questions. And uh, uh, thanks to our viewers who joined from different countries, including Tanzania, Kenya, Peru, Turkey, Nepal, Saudi Arabia, Lithuania, India, UK, Pakistan. So thanks for your encouragement and support. And don't forget to subscribe our YouTube channel and follow the Facebook page so that you can stay updated with the upcoming lectures. And thanks to Dr. Boyd for your time and effort. And our next lecture is on May 16th. So we will have a hematopathology board review. That is the second lecture in that series. And our speaker will be uh, Dr. Genevieve Crane, who is a staff pathologist at Cleveland Clinic. So hope to see you at that time. And it would be at the same time, that is uh, 9 a.m. Pacific on May 16th. Thank you again, Dr. Boyd. Thanks Thank you, Dr. Man Manon, and everyone else. Have a good one. Thank you.